dear birth grade students at the Department of Economics. This is our first recorded lecture for the module entitled Economics of Investment and Financial Markets. As you know, recorded lectures are used instead of face-to-face -face interactive lectures. This came as a precautionary procedure against the spread of coronavirus. I'm praying that you are all safe and healthy. The recorded lecture is to be used in conjunction with your textbook. Don't hesitate to contact me for any further questions and help. The current presentation briefly discusses Chapter 3 of Michigan and Ekins 2012. The title of the chapter is What do interest rates mean and what is their rule of valuation? Interest rates are among the most closely watched variables in the economy. Their movements are reported almost daily by the news media. Local and international news media recently reported that several central banks around the world have cut their interest rates. These central banks include the US Federal Reserve Bank, the Bank of England, the European Central Bank for the Eurozone, and the Central Bank of Egypt. Cutting interest rates came in response to the economic damage caused by the spread of coronavirus. For example, the European Central Bank offers cheap loans to commercial banks in order to encourage them to lend to small firms. It also expands its quantitative easing program. With regard to Egypt, its central bank cut interest rates by the most ever in an emergency meeting, which is a, which is, which is a sign that the central bank is less focused on the risk of capital outflows. Thus, a relevant question might be, why are movements of interest rates heavily covered by news media? Given this introduction and that you studied economics of money and banking and the macroeconomics, I am sure that you know the answer. But let us, let us explain it briefly in the next slide. The extensive coverage of interest rate movements by media is explained by the fact that interest rates directly affect all economic variables and therefore our everyday lives. Interest rates influence the cost of borrowing, the return on savings, and they are also an important component of the total return of many investments. From our previous face-to-face -face lectures, you have been told that Interest rates affect planned investment spending. That is business fixed investment, inventory investment, and residential investment. Also, interest rates influence international capital flows. Moreover, they affect the budget deficits and variations in exchange rates. In addition, certain interest rates provide insights into future economic and financial market activity. They affect uh, personal decisions, household decisions. For instance, interest rates affect our personal decisions such as whether to consume or save, whether to buy a house, and whether to purchase bond or put funds into a saving account. Studying the current chapter helps to develop a better understanding of interest rates. In addition, the terminology and the calculations of various interest rates are to be examined. The importance of these rates in our lives and the general economy would be discussed. Hence, topics discussed include measuring interest rates, the distinction between real and nominal interest rates, the distinction between interest rates and returns, there are different debt instruments. As we will see, these debt instruments include simple loan, fixed payment loan, coupon bond, and discount bond. They have very different streams of cash payments to the holder with various timing. These streams of cash payments are known as cash flows. All else being equal, debt instruments are evaluated 
against one another. This evaluation is based upon the amount of each cash flow and the timing of each cash flow. This evaluation in which the analysis of the amount and the timing of the instrument cash flows lead to its yield to maturity or interest rate is called present value analysis. Thus, it's reasonable to understand the concept of present value before studying how interest rates are measured. Actually, you have been introduced to the concept of present value while studying other courses such as mathematics of investment and finance. However, let us introduce it again. The concept of present value is easily to be understood. It is based on the common sense idea that a dollar of cash flow which paid to you one year later is less valuable to you than a dollar paid to you immediately or now. Why is that true? This is true because you can deposit a dollar in a saving account. By doing so, you can earn interest and have more than a dollar in one year. Let us explain this point by looking at the simplest kind of debt instruments, which we will call a simple loan. In this type of loans, I mean a simple loan, the lender provides the borrower with an amount of funds that must be repaid to the lender at the maturity date along with an additional payment for the interest. Note that the initial value of the loan is termed as principal, whereas the maturity date could be defined as the date on which the principal amount of a debt instrument becomes due and is repaid to the lender. For instance, assume that you lend one of your friends a simple loan of, say, $100 for one year. You would require him or her to repay the principal of $100 in one year time along with an additional payment for interest, say, for example, $10. In such a case of a simple loan, the interest payment divided by the amount of the loan is a natural and sensible way to measure the interest rate. This measure is known as a simple interest rate. As mentioned in the previous slide, the interest payment is divided by the amount of the loan. Thus, the simple interest rate that your friend has to pay to you is 10%. At the end of the year, you would have $110, which can be rewritten as shown here. Now assume that you lent out the $110 at the end of the second year. Hence, you would have $121. We could obtain this number in a different way, as shown, shown below. We first add the interest rate to 1 and then raise this new rate to the power of 2. Finally, you multiply this outcome by the principal. This rule could be generalized to any number of years, as shown below. The figure displayed below shows the timeline of the amounts you would get at the end of each year through making the $100 loan today. This timeline immediately informs you that you are just as happy having $100 today as having $133 in a period of three years from now, and vice versa. In other words, the timeline tells us that we can also work backward from future amounts to the present. Let me explain this point using the above mentioned example. Having $133 three years from now is worth $100 today. What we have done is discounting the future cash value that is $133 by 
the discount rate which is the interest rate plus one taking into our consideration the number of years passes from now until the future period the process of calculating today's value of dollars received in the future as we have done um, above is called discounting the future so we could use the following formula to obtain present values for a number of for any number of years present value equals future cash flows discounted by interest rate plus one raised to the power of n years the concept of present value as we have just seen is useful since it allows us to compute today's value of the market instruments at a given simple interest rate this is simply done by just adding up the present value of all the future cash flows received this concept enables us to compare the value of two instruments with completely different timing of their cash flows there are four basic types of credit instruments that incorporates present value concepts as mentioned earlier they are simple loan fixed payment loan coupon bond and discount bond we have just explained the instrument of simple loan so there is no need to repeat it uh, a fixed payment loan is a loan for which the loan principal and interest rate are rebate in several pay payments often monthly in equal dollar amounts over the loan term for instance if you borrow $1,000 for five years for an interest rate of say 10% a fixed payment loan might require you to pay $300 every year for five years An installment loans such as autos loan auto loans pardon and home mortgage are examples of fixed payment type Regarding coupon bonds, a coupon bond is a debt instrument that pays the owner of the bond a fixed interest payment every year until the maturity date when a specified final amount which is the face value or par value is rebate. The face value or the par value is the nominal value or dollar value of a security is stated by the issuer. A coupon bond with $1,000 face value, for example, might be you a coupon payment of $100 per year for 10 years and at the maturity date repay you the face value amount of $1,000. Finally, discount bond or a zero coupon bond is bought at a price below its face value. In other words, it is bought at a discount and the face value is repaid at the maturity date thus a discount bond doesn't make any interest payments it is just pays off the face value for example a discount bond with a face value of $1,000 might be bought for $900 and in a year's time the owner would be repaid the face value of $1,000. The aforementioned types of credit instruments require payments at different times. Simple loans and discount points make payments only at their maturity dates, whereas fixed payment loans and coupon bond make payments periodically until maturity. Thus, a relevant question is, how would we decide which of these instruments offer us more income? They all seem different since they have payments at different times. To tackle this problem, we use the concept of present value, which has been discussed earlier, 
to provide us with a procedure for measuring interest rates in these various types of instruments. The most important way to compute interest rates is the yield to maturity. The yield to maturity is the interest rate that equates the present value of cash flows received from a debt instrument with its value today. Financial economists consider yield to maturity as the most accurate measure of interest rates. To understand the yield to maturity better, we now consider how it is computed for the four types of credit market instruments. Again, the key issue in all these examples is to understand that the calculation of the yield to maturity is done through equating today's value of the, debt, of the debt instrument with the present value of all its future cash flow payments. Employing the concept of present value, the yield to maturity on a simple loan is very easy to calculate. Let us use example 3.2 to show that. In this example, Pete borrows $100 from his sister. In the next year, she wants $110 back from him. We are asked to compute the yield to maturity on this loan. We can use the provided information to solve for the, to solve for the yield to maturity by recognizing that the present value of the future payments must equal today's value of a loan. Let us solve it in the next slide. The computation of the yield to maturity is straightforward. Since we used the attached formula to find the interest rate that makes the present value of $100 today equals the future cash flow of $110 in one year later. We just plug the numbers into the formula to obtain the value of 10% as a yield to maturity. Thus, we have recognized that for a simple loan, the simple interest rate equals the yield to maturity. Accordingly, the same term I is used to denote the yield to maturity and interest rate, simple interest rate as well. So the simple I is used for both the yield to maturity and the simple interest rate. Uh, remember that for the fixed payment loan, the borrower makes the same payment to the lender, say the bank, every year or every month until the maturity date in which the loan is completely paid off. We adopt the same strategy used for the simple loan, but since the fixed payment loan it fixed, uh, involves more than one cash flow payment, the present value of the fixed payment loan is calculated as the sum of the present values of all payments using equation 2 as shown blue. In this equation, the loan value equals the discounted fixed yearly cash flow payment up to the number of years until the maturity date. For a fixed payment loan amount, the fixed periodically, yearly or monthly payment is known and the number of years until maturity is also known. The yield to maturity is not. So we can solve the equation 2 for the yield to maturity, equation 2, which is previously shown in the previous, previous slide. It is worth mentioning that this calculation is quite difficult. However, many pocket calculators have programs that enables you to find the yield to maturity, given that you know the loan value, the fixed periodically payment, and the number of years until maturity. Alternatively, Excel can be used in this context. A very useful book to help you in this regard is written by Melcher at Norton 2017. It shows how to do all the calculations using both pocket calculators 
and Excel. Let's have a numerical example. The following example is solved in your textbook using a financial calculator. Given that you don't have such a calculator, but you are familiar with using Microsoft Excel, it's much better to use Excel. In example 3.3, we are given the following pieces of information. We know that the loan value equals $100,000 and the annual interest rate is 7% and the years to maturity is 20 years. What we are going to do is to plug these numbers into Formula 2 as shown below. The task is to compute yearly payment for this loan. We will do this task using Excel. From the Excel toolbar that is shown by screenshot 1, select formula and then insert function as depicted by screenshot 2 to bring the insert function dialog box. In this dialog box, select financial as the category. By doing so, all financial functions are displayed. You select BMT function as shown by the screenshot 3. This brings the PMT function that is used to compute the periodic payment as we will see. In screenshot 3, you should uh, press the OK button to bring the function argument as we will see in the next slides. Uh, figure 1 uh, shows the periodic payments function argument dialog box. Arguments of interest for us are number of periods, uh, present value, which is the loan value in our case, rate, which is the interest rate, FV, which is the future value in our case, it would be the amount of the loan at the maturity date. Their numbers are given in figure two. By inserting these numbers shown in figure two in figure one in the function argument, um, then the uh, value of the uh, periodic, uh, periodic uh, payment appears. You could see this value at the very bottom of the screenshot uh, figure one. In addition, I made another screenshot uh, that shows the number uh, of the periodic payments highlighted in uh, yellow. It is the same number as solved in your textbook using the uh, financial calculator. Table 3.1 provides some interesting facts concerning the yields to maturity computed for several bond prices. It displays the yields to maturity on a 10% coupon rate bond that matures in 10 years with a face value of $1,000. First, the yield to maturity equals the coupon rate when the coupon bond is priced at its face value. In other words, the yield to maturity equals 10%, which is the same as the coupon rate when the price of the coupon is $1,000. That is the face value. Second, the price of coupon bond is negatively linked to the yield to maturity. That is, as the yield to maturity increases, the price of the bond falls, and vice versa. Third, if the bond price is below its face value, then the yield to maturity is greater than the coupon rate. Calculation of the yield to maturity for a discount bond is similar to that for the simple loan. Let us consider a discount bond such as a one-year U.S. Treasury bill that pays a face value of $1,000 in a one year of time. Assume that the current purchase price of this bill is $900. By equating this price to the present value of the $1,000 received in one year and solving for I, we obtain the value of 
11.1% at the yield to maturity. Generally, for any one year discount bond, the yield to maturity can be computed according to equation 6. Equation 6 tells us that the yield to maturity equals the increase in price over the year divided by the initial price. By covering this point, we reach at the end of the current literature. The list of the chapter is to be discussed in the next literature. Thank you so much and see you, pardon, and meet you next literature.